And he came out and went as he was wont. And wont means accustomed or used to, as he was wont to do. To the Mount of Olives, and his disciple also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, and saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Verse 45, and when he arose from prayer, he was come to his disciples, found them sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray lest ye enter into temptation. And my subject is taking self out of the equation, taking self out of the equation. We're going to ask God just to talk to us a little bit today and ask him to break the bread of life in our hearts so that we may be benefited and blessed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, O God, for your loving kindness and we thank you for your presence. Thank you for the presence of the angels. And Lord God, we thank you for your people. And as we have come to sit in your presence, Lord, and to worship and to hear the word of the Lord, I pray that you would anoint our hearts, Lord, and you would baptize us with a fresh desire to serve you. And Lord, as we have read your word, I pray that you would break it to our hearts. And that, Lord, as we meditate and hear your word, it'll change us. Change us from ourselves to be more like you. And, oh, God, would you lay your nail-scarred hand upon us? And would you soften our hearts? And would you mold our spirit, oh, God? Amen. We don't want to be like we are now, but we want more to be like you. God, therefore, I pray that you would touch us in a very real way. That when we shall have left here, we will know that we have stood in your presence. Lord, I pray for this city in which we live. That, oh God, somewhere along the line, you would deal with their hearts. As only you could do. And Lord God, that you will release the angels of the harvest to bring them to a place of repentance. Lord, I pray that you will touch the lips of clay as I minister the word of the Lord, that hearts will be encouraged and strengthened to go another mile. Take absolute authority over this place, this atmosphere. We bind every demon from hell. We cast it down. We forbid it to operate and release a spirit of praise a spirit of faith and repentance. And Lord, God, would you grip our hearts with conviction. Deal with us, Lord, as only you could do. And Lord, I pray that you would bless us in a marked way. And then, Lord, we will be careful to praise you and to honor you and to give you all of the glory that is due to your wonderful and your precious name. In Jesus' name I pray and all the people say amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Taking self out of the equation. One of the greatest struggles that we all have in serving God is the struggle with self and specifically how do we get self out of the way we are our own most worst enemies 
it is not other people, but we are ourselves worst main main enemies. Someone once observed said if he could kick the person who was most responsible for his problems, then his behind would be so sore he wouldn't be able to sit down. So we give ourselves most of the problems. Brother Paul Mooney told us several years ago about a seminar that he had attended. He said he paid good money for that seminar and he went there and he said he learned only one thing. He paid good money. And he said he learned a very valuable lesson. He had gone there with the intention to learn a lot, but he said only one lesson. That is a valuable lesson. He said this. He said he learned that people are really not against you. They're just for themselves. So people are not against you. They're just for themselves. Sometimes we feel that people are against us. No, they're just for themselves. And that's a valuable lesson that we you should really remember. As humans, we are self-centered and self-promoting and sometimes self-absorbed. With us, it is always looking out for number one. How can I look good? How can I promote myself? What is best for me? How can I leverage this situation to give me the maximum benefit? This is always true of all humans because we are innately selfish. We are innately selfish. Many times it's what is it, what is in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? And then when we come to the Lord, when we are converted, there is a radical change that must take place. And put this change in place. And this change is dying to ourselves. We got to die to ourselves. To us, this is a painful process. Painful process that takes a lifetime to accomplish this consistently. Dying to our will and then embracing the will of God is a goal that all of us have to really embrace. The principle of decreasing so that the Lord can increase is really what our text is all about. And I'm going to ask you if you'd allow me just to point out three things, three very important concepts from the word of God. Firstly, Jesus himself taught us to pray the will of God. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, part of it says, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And he was given a model prayer. You don't have to pray this verbatim, but you've got to look at the component parts and then pray it. And part of it, pray that thy will be done. God's will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So here we see that the will of God is consistently done in heaven. And I would imagine that applies to everything that goes on in heaven. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, the apostle John tells us that there were four beasts or creatures, is probably a better word, had each of them had six wings about them and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night, saying, 
Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. That's what they do day and night. You say, do they get tired? I don't know. But the Bible said they did that day and night. So the will of God is done in heaven consistently. There's no rebellion in there. There was one man and some of the people that followed him, some of the angels that followed him, they were of a different persuasion, and the Lord asked them to leave. And so in heaven then, the will of God is consistently carried out. The problem is getting the will of God consistently done on earth. That's the problem. Not just collectively, but also individually. It is hard to get us to do the will of God. Even when we know the will of God. That's because we're self-centered. Our Western mindset of showing the rugged individual and the importance of the individual poses a great problem when it comes to God. It's because with God's economy, we have to do things his way. We always have to change to please God. What if, what if God is not happy with the way we live? Then we have to change the way we live. We're not going to change God now. You know, our world thinks that they're going to change God to, to come and, and, and sit in their mess. No, sir. God is not about to do that. We have to change. God, want, God really wants to unseat us from the throne of our heart. He wants us to abdicate. He wants to get on the throne of our heart because God reigns most effectively from the throne of our hearts. And he wants to reign. He wants to rule from our heart. He, want, he, wants, he wants to become master and king and ruler and Lord of our heart. So he wants to reign from there. That is how he reigns most effectively. And so God is wanting us to abdicate. His kingdom really is about the heart. I mean, we, we, we will talk about a physical kingdom at some point, but mainly is the kingdom that's in the heart. The heart in Scripture, when we look at it, it has at least three things attached to it. Firstly, the intellect. So God wants us to learn a lot about him. He wants us to study his word, become acquainted with his ways, become acquainted with how he operates. Our intellect should be given to, to God. Secondly, there are those things concerning our emotions. And we've got to love the Lord and serve him with gladness. If we're going to really be effective, we have to love coming to the house of God. You shouldn't say, I'm going to, I'm going to the house of God because pastor is going to ask me. No, you ought to love to come to the house of God. It shouldn't be, do I have to go back to service Sunday night? No, it's, I get to go back because I love to be in the house of God. And we're glad about it. One songwriter said I, said, I found joy in his company every day. When I seem to be alone and everything going wrong, uh, but I find joy in his company. We, we ought to love the house of God. We ought to rejoice when we get to come to the house of God. We ought to be pining after the house of God. And then thirdly, our wills, our, 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 our emotions, our, our volition rather. Our will really has to be bended so that God can take control of it. Our, 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 our volition, it should be, amen, I, 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 I will do this. David said, those that know thy name will put their trust in thee. So we got, our will has to be brought under the sway of the Holy Ghost. And our heart has got to be given to God. Our intellect, our emotions, and our will got to revolve 
around God. Secondly, God's will has to become our focus. God's will has to become our focus. If you notice Jesus' remarks in John chapter 4 and verse 34, it's quite instructive when we consider it. Jesus saith unto them, this was the occasion of that woman that he dealt with at, at, at Sychar's well there. He says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. His meat, his food, the thing that keeps him living. Just like food keep the physical body living, Jesus is asserting that the will of God was his meat. That is what caused him to live. That means if he's not doing the will of God, he can't live. We have to get ourselves to the place where the will of God becomes our meat. It's going to sustain us. What I live by is to know that I am doing and fulfilling the will of God for my life. I can't be focused on myself. The focus should not be me anymore, but the focus should be doing the will of God. What do I have to do in this situation, in that situation, to please God? It's not about how I'm going to be pleased. It's not about how, what make me happy. It's what God is going to see when I do. He wants to know I, I am pleasing him. One point says, I mean, he says, I, whatever I do, I seek to please God. I seek his favor in everything I do. So it's not what pleases me, but rather what will please God. And so we won't be puffed up if things don't go our way. If they don't go our way, if God has his way, then that's all right. Our meat will be how do I please God in this situation? And so we will take the me, the M-E, out of the equation. Take that out. Jettison that me out of the equation. And it's not about me anymore. It's all about Jesus. Let's focus on Jesus. Let's get Jesus in the equation, friend. John the Baptist says, I'm going to have to decrease if the Lord is going to become effective in our life, we have to decrease. The self has to go down. And let Jesus become real. Let him become big. David said, oh, magnify the Lord. That, that means the Lord has become large in our life. And then we will see what the Lord is going to do. And so it's all about Jesus. If you notice during Jesus' Temptation in the flesh. Three times he answered the tempter. It is written. So you got to know, you have to eat up the word. You have to eat that book. You've got to know this word. You've got to study this word. It has to become your meat. It's what drives you. It's the motor force. It's how you live. It is written, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And this is a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. So the way we live is really a product of what we eat. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I said the way we live is a product of what we eat. If we eat the word of God, we're going to live the word of God. If we eat junk food, that's how we're going to live. We eat up that television. We're going to be talking about as the world turns and as you die, whatever they call it. The young and the restless. They have those crazy stuff, young and restless. If that's what you eat, you're going you're gonna to live that. You're going to talk about that. But if you said, I was glad. When they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. If you live God, if you live his word. It's going to be reflective how you walk. And so I got a feast at Jesus' table. 
Sometimes we got to quit going to Denny's, quit going to Longhorn and draw to the table and say, Lord, we're here. We're hungry. Feed us. Feed us with the finest of the wheat. Give us meat in due season. We're tired of ourselves, tired of focusing ourselves, how nice we are, how good we look, how much money we have, how much influence we throw. We need to get tired of that, beloved. Tired of that. And talk about it's all about Jesus. More of his glory would I see. Tell me more about Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me know about his love. Talk to me about his grace. God has to become our meal. He has to become our focus. Self has to be slain. Slay self. Notice Paul's, what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified. I am crucified with Christ. You know, the, the, the reason sometimes that we're so focused on self is because we haven't been crucified. When we're crucified, we're going to die. And we need to stay crucified. Hallelujah. Somebody told the Lord, why don't you come down from this tree? No, he said, no, I'm going to stay on here. I'm going to stay crucified. I want the hammer and the nail to continue. I'm going to stay up here. We need to stay on that. We need to stay on that cross. Stay crucified. Get, lose ourselves. Oh, Lord, have mercy. We got to pay that price, beloved, to be crucified. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet, not I, but Christ. Christ needs to live out his life through us. Our personal agenda has to die and let us install Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. Many times we... We get mad and we get offended because our self is still alive. And then we feel that we have to defend our reputation, defend our, our rights, defend and show that we're important instead of us being crucified. Though he was from glory, he, he crucified put on that cross and they crucified. Even people walked by and spat on him. The Bible said, cursed is everyone that, that hung on a tree. And there was Jesus on a tree. So that you and I can be lifted up. But sometimes we, we just too, too defensive about who we are. Hallelujah. How, how important we are. And really at the end of the day, we're not important. No way. Hallelujah. We just fool ourselves. We just become delusional how important we are. We, we're not important, no way. We die and they put us down six feet or whatever they do, cover it up and they go home. You just think that you're important, but we're not. And somebody said, dust to dust. And ashes to ashes. We love you well, but Jesus love you best. Goodbye. Good night, friend. Hallelujah. Hear what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. Let this, <clears throat> Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but observe now, but made himself of no reputation. So sometimes we're defending our reputation, you know. Took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion of a man, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Made himself of no reputation. 
And so sometimes, beloved, we just feel like we have to just defend our reputation. We don't want to be somewhat put on. We don't really want people to really encroach in our space because we're important. But I tell you, saints of God, we've got to get self out of that equation. When we get self out of there and focus on Jesus, we're going to see great results. We're going to see great results. Self has always proved to be a failure. In everything then, we have to focus on Jesus. Take our eyes off our hurt. We are feeling get hurt. That hurt feeling. We don't really feel like people respecting us. We don't feel like we're being held up in esteem and the dignity that is due to us. Just feel like people just taking too much liberty with us. And did they not know who we were? Hallelujah, anyhow. Lord have mercy. The old I get, the more I know that I'm nothing. Hallelujah. And so if people offend me, well, it's, it's not a big thing. They offended the Lord. So it's part of the territory. Just go pray a little bit more. So it help me. Teach me. Teach me, Lord. So it's not about us. It's not about our hurt feelings. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3. For consider him. See, sometimes the reason why we get so hurt and so bent out of shape, we forget Calvary. One songwriter said, it, when we have missed our way, just lead me back to Calvary. Because at Calvary, my perspective then becomes real. I know what he had to go through to buy me as a sinner. He brought me also out of an harbor pit. So we weren't that good. So at Calvary, we know what it took to, to bring us to where we are. So we get a good perspective. So the writer is challenging us. He said, for consider him, that is Jesus, that endures such contradicting of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. So consider what Jesus went through. Lest we start to feel like, well, people are really, they're really disrespecting me. I wonder if they disrespected the Lord. I wonder if he was the God of glory. I wonder if he was God that came down as a man. I wonder if he was the one that spake and it was done and commanded and it stood forth. I wonder if he's the one that flung the stars in outer space. I wonder if he's the one that put the planet in place. I wonder if he is the one that walked on the, on the water. I wonder if he is the one that the Bible said they saw him and the hills skipped like lamb. Consider him. Let's consider Jesus. Less we faint. Less we become discouraged. When they spat on him, riled in him, the Bible said he's led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearer is dumb, and the word of God testify, he opened not his mouth. So we got to consider him. We got to focus on him, lest we just feel like we're something. And that we are God's answer to all that ails mankind. 
Thirdly, let us remember Gethsemane. We read about Gethsemane and people of God, I tell you what. I think we should never forget that fateful night when our Lord wound his way into the garden called Gethsemane. And you know, if we would, we could actually juxtapose this garden. We could put it side by side. We could line them up with the garden that our first parents were placed in, the Garden of Eden. And we know there just by the narrative in the Genesis that our parents failed God, failed to submit themselves to God. Failed to obey one single command that they should not eat of the tree that was in the midst of the garden. And here was Jesus then in the garden. It is thought that Gethsemane was at the foot of the Mount of Olives. And it had some large olives tree in there. And the thing about that was... In order to get the oil, because the oil that they used primarily came from olives. In order to get the oil from the olives, you had to crush the olives. Or to get grapes, get the juice from the grape, you have to crush it. And so Jesus really was entering into that garden to be crushed by the weight of our sin. And in order for life to come out of it, he had to be crushed. And here was him going there. And we got to know if God is going to get the, 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 the glory out of our lives, we have to be crushed in order for the fragrance to come out of our lives sometimes. We got to be crushed in order for virtue, in order for something worthwhile. We got to be crushed ourselves. That's got to die. So our Lord wound his way into this garden. John add a little bit more detail in John chapter 18, we can read verse 1, 2. When Jesus has spoken these words, this is after the upper room. He went forth with his disciple over the book Cedron, where it was a garden into which he had entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. Observe, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. So it's a, it's a place that he went to. He frequented there many times. He went there to pray because Jesus had a purpose. A lot of times we, we get out of order because we don't know our purpose. Our purpose is not, not to be happy. Many times, you know, I made mention one time. I said, now, Jesus' purpose is really not to make us happy. It's because a lot of times people just want Jesus to make them happy. Well, there's not a scripture that said the Lord's reason, purpose is to make us happy. The Bible said the will of God is that all men should be saved. The Lord wants us to be saved. And a lot of time in that process, we're not going to be happy. How many of you are happy if they crucify you? Well, did you know that that all of the apostles, with the exception of the apostle John, was crucified, was, was killed? You think that that was a lot of happiness? But there was joy. Joy in fulfilling the Lord's will. See, there's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness only based on what's happening. You get a check in the mail, people are all happy. But that's not going to bring you joy. Joy is knowing your relationship with God is on solid ground. That'll give you joy, regardless of what's happening. So you can have joy in the midst of storm. You can have joy in, in weeping. You can have joy when everything is going upside down. Our relationship is based on, on joy and knowing that, yes, we're in, we're in fellowship with God. And so I told them if God's will was was not to make us happy. And they got all knurled up. They, how do you mean? God's will is to make me happy. Well, you're out of scripture. See, sometimes when you feel that, it, 
God is going to try and make you happy. That's where you lose out. So when things are not going well so that you get happy, you feel that God had forgotten you. But it's not about your happiness. It has nothing about that. It is about the will of God. It's about thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So he goes into this garden and Jesus now has come to what I call his zero hour. This is the time when all the miracles done. He's finished with healing this and finished with raising Lazarus. This is the zero hour that he really came into the world to, to accomplish. And it would now would be a test to see if he would finish it. The cross loom large on the horizon, I believe. And then the cup was quite distasteful. And bitter. The cup really is, a, is really a summary of his life and purpose. Psalm 75 verse 8. The psalmist says, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. Wine is red and mixture, full of mixture and the poured out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. So the cup Jesus was talking about. Was that he had to drink this cup full of mixture, full of sin, sin of Adam, sin of all the Old Testament saints, sin of all the New Testament, sin of all the world. Because all sinned, all sins are judged at Calvary. And there he was. That's the cup. And he had to drink it. The wicked will drink the drags, but he had to drink. That cup had to take that sin in his holy body. Didn't know in his sin. This was a very horrible thing for a holy, holy Jesus. Now remember now, Jesus is 100% man and also 100% God. And so there's two wills. There's the human will, but then there's the eternal will. And there's a wrestling because there, there is this struggle from the human side to survive and to preserve life. Most of us in this room, if I ask you, if you will willingly have somebody kill you, most of us said, well, no, I think I'll pass on that. See, most of us want to preserve our life. If we hear somebody say fire, or if we hear somebody say there's a gun guy coming around, or if we hear some, we're going to be, we're going to boogie out of this place like we, we never heard it. I mean, we're going to say, come foot, let's get out of here. Why, why is that? We want to preserve our life. We don't want to get killed. We want to preserve our life. And so that's what was happening there. There is the will of the flesh to preserve the life. And then there's the will of God to give your life a ransom for our sin. And there's a wrestle. There is a fight. And so our first parents surrendered in the Garden of Eden. But the man, the man Christ Jesus called the second of Adam. The second Adam is there. And he goes to pray three times in the account of all the evangelists. And he goes. And there's a rustling. You know, we should know this. That in Gethsemane, the emotional stress that was on our Lord was far greater than at Calvary. Because in Gethsemane, when he left Gethsemane, that was a fait accompli. That, that's already done. He's already done that. Yes, I'm going to go. And so he, there he was in Gethsemane. The struggle. If you notice in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more then shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered up himself without spot to God purge your consciences from dead works to serve the living 
God. See, so he's offering up himself. That struggle. Do I, do I just walk out of this, this garden here and just say, well, you know, that's, that's it. Or do I pay the price? Take all the sins of the old world. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. So the Lord took our sins. You see, we have to understand all the rapists, all the murderers, the liars, and the thieves, the whole all of that, all of that sin. The Lord had to bear all of that. So that was a horrible thing. I said that that his so his human, his human side recoiled from that. Many maybe maybe if I give you this analogy, you'll you'll see what I mean. Suppose you had somebody broke into your house. And they come in there and they ravish everything. They take stuff. Then they write all kind of ungodly stuff in your house and scatter all kind of stuff. When you come back in your house, you feel like, boy, it's almost like, you know, I've been raped. I've been, I've been done some terrible thing. They've, they've just tore up my place. You might not even want to even live in there anymore. Well, that's what sin, that's what all of that sin in Jesus' body had to take that in order for you and me to be free. In order for you and me to have forgiveness of sin. It wasn't an easy thing. You know, when we, when we, when we sometimes think about those things, we don't bring it home to us. Because if we did, then we would have, we would have a, an understanding of the gravity of what the Lord paid for our, our redemption. And we wouldn't squabble and just squawk about everything anymore. We, then we become more reflective. If you notice in, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 14, I'm going to. Read it and then show you this. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, here's the five wills of Satan. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the, upon the mount of the congregation of the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of cloud. I will. The five I wills. This is what Satan does. I will. I will. But Jesus in this garden surrenders his will. Verse 42. Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Nevertheless, I, I want to escape. I want to forgo this cup. I want to say no, but your will is for me to pay the price, the ultimate price. Your will is for me to die. Your will is for me to drink this cup filled with the sins of all of Adam's falling race. Jesus said, I would want to escape it. But if it is your will for me to drink it, I'm going to acquiesce in that and I'm going to drink it. All of us must come face to face with God's divine will. And we must surrender our will to his will in the end. And that is why we're going to find joy. See, this is where we're going to find joy. And I'm getting ready to close. But I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 12 and consider verse 2. This is where when we, when we start to do the will of God, we're going to have joy. Woo, Holy Ghost. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Observe. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy of what? The relationship between that, that man Christ Jesus and the eternal spirit that gave that life in the first place. And so for the joy that was set before him, 
endure the cross, despising the shame. And he sat down by the right hand of God. In other words, he has finished his job. He, man, he has done what he, was, what he was made to do. He's finished the job. Beloved, sometimes when we look at our lives, we're tempted to complain if things go, just don't go the way we want them to go. But we need to consider Jesus. To friend, to find joy and purpose and find fulfillment in our life, we got to surrender ourselves to God. We must take self out of that equation in our life. And it must become all about Jesus. I'm closing with this. One songwriter said, many years I long for rest. Perfect peace within my breast. And I often sought the Lord alone with tears. But I would not pay the price. I would not make that sacrifice. And so I wandered on and on for many years. But the chorus said, but let me lose myself and find it, Lord, in thee. May all self be slain and my friends see only thee. Though it cost me grief and pain, I will find my life again if I lose myself and find it, Lord. In the let's stand. I don't know if you're here. And I don't know what role the Lord plays in your life. But if we would consider taking the self out of the equation and simply focus on Jesus. And let Jesus be all that really matters. We're going to have joy and purpose and fulfillment in our lives. Friend, if you haven't, if you haven't considered the Lord and you haven't made him Lord of your life, why don't you come and let's talk to Jesus? Let's just come, let's just come and talk to the Lord.